to move away from the nuclear medicine diagnostics and therapies and talk a little bit about clinical trials. So we are really appreciative of having Dr. Bergslin join us also from UCSF to talk about this. All right, well thank you very much to Pam and, and the other organizers and it's a really a pleasure to be here today. It's great to see so many people present and this talk fits really nicely um, right after uh, Tom's talk on PRT because I think there's so many questions about how to use that and what I'm gonna try to do is explain how this all works, like how we actually advance the field. It really is uh, because of clinical trials and participation in trials that drives the advancement in this disease and other diseases. So just to give you some hope, I want to tell you there's actually lots of drugs under development for cancer. I mean, this is all cancers, and this is data from 2015. But at that point, there were almost 600 drugs in development. Um, but what's sobering is the median time from the filing of the patent or the, you know, the structure of the molecule um, to when it's actually approved is close to 10 years. And there's a lot going on to try to speed up that process. But there is definitely movement. There were 15 new cancer drugs approved in 2015. And in the neuroendocrine field, we've also uh, felt that, that improvement. And so these are, this is a slide uh, that actually shows just a sort of scope of the advances over the last um, 30 years or so. And what you can see is really it's been in the last five years that we've had some, some significant advances with, with approval of Everolimus and Sunitinib for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, Everolimus for the non-pancreatic well-differentiated tumors, Lanreotide for GEPNETs, and then we have Telotrostat and PRT that are under FDA review. So there's definitely a lot happening in this disease, a lot of interest, and a lot of research in this area. Um, now, what is a clinical trial? trial? Well, that's research that involves people. Uh, it differs, differs by the trial, uh, the type of trial, and the phase of the trial. And each trial follows a very specific set of guidelines. And I'm going to go through this for you to explain that. Uh, we're very detail-oriented, and the, the rules are very strict with clinical trials, but it's for a reason. That's how we actually have high-quality data and how those data um, hopefully ultimately are accepted by the FDA when they're considering approval processes. So it's the final step in a very long process. Actually, before it ever hits the clinic, there's a lot of work that's been done. And as I said before, this is how we actually demonstrate that a new drug is safe and that it has activity. Now, I will point out that obviously the more people participate, the faster we can accrue to trials and reach the target, the target size of the trial, and I'll go over how we determine size, the faster we get our results. And what's really interesting is in the United States, the majority of children go on clinical trials, but in adults, there are all sorts of barriers at play. And in fact, it's under 5% of patients who actually participate in a clinical trial. And we'll, if we have time, we can talk about some of those challenges, but there are many. Um, but of course, we're always trying to um, enhance the availability of clinical trials. Okay. All right. Yay! Okay, so um, even within the clinical trial realm, so this is trials that involve people, there are a variety of different types of trials. And most of what I'm going to be talking about would be treatment trials, where you're actually receiving a therapy or an intervention of some type. But there are other types of trials out there as well, including prevention, trials associated with imaging, um, quality of life, et cetera. Uh, so this is the basic schema for drug development in general. Again, it starts out with an idea, discovering a compound that has activity, a bunch of studies that are called preclinical, meaning before you get humans, which might be in cells in a dish or it might be in animals, and ultimately a variety of different types of trials are done, ultimately, hopefully, leading to FDA approval. And this, as I said, generally takes on the order of nine or ten years to complete. Now, there are several different phases of trials. These slides will be available um, ultimately, so I'll, I'll go over this pretty briefly. But in short, phase one trials are the very first step. This is a new drug or a new drug combination that's being tested largely for safety to understand how we should give it, how frequently should we give it, what dose should we give. It's very much focused on the safety of the agent. You may also be looking at how well it works and checking CT scans, but the primary endpoint is really focused on the safety and how to deliver deliver the drug. Phase two studies are really looking at, generally speaking, how that drug works in a particular tumor type. But I would think of it more as a pilot study, generally, where you're trying to get a sense as to whether the drug has activity. But these are generally not definitive. 
For that, you need to have phase three study and studies. And in those studies, usually the goal is to compare your new idea, your new combination with whatever is considered standard. If there's no standard therapy or no available standard therapy, then it might be placebo. And those studies, phase three studies, are almost always are typically randomized. And then sometimes after a drug is approved, there might be additional studies. Those are called phase four, where there, uh, there are reasons to assess other types of data, data that might be relevant after drug approval. Now, looked at it in a slightly different way, because this is something that often comes up when patients are wondering why it's taking so long for things to get approved. Just to give you an idea, phase one studies can be very small. Um, they often you know, don't have large numbers of patients. It's usually less than 100, but it can still take a year or two sometimes to get the data. Again, the goal is mostly looking at safety and how to deliver a drug. Phase two trials are a bit larger. They may or may not be randomized, meaning a computer decides between two different treatment options. Um, but again, the idea is to try to see whether this drug does in fact have activity in a specific disease type. And then phase threes typically take longer because they're larger numbers of patients. Often, you know, in some cases, they might be many thousands of patients. In the neuroendocrine world, our phase three trials have typically been in the range of three to 400 patients. So relatively small, actually, as phase three trials go, but they can still take several years nonetheless. Now, how are these funded? This is another thing that comes up because while we may have great ideas and things that we want to test, there are some realities at play that we have to actually be able to fund the trial. We have a number of people working on trials at any given time that are collecting the data, making sure the trial is done appropriately and following the protocol and all the rules and regulation, and there's a cost to that. And so sometimes these are ideas that we as investigators might come up with and we might approach a pharmaceutical company about. Out. Those are what would be called investigator-initiated trials. Um, other times, they might be they might be industry-initiated, meaning a company like Merck or Novartis or Lexicon or AAA or Pfizer might have ideas and promote them. And then in other cases, there's support from the NIH, and that often is filtered through what are called cooperative groups. These are very large groups of institutions across the country who have come together largely to get some of these larger trials done. And um, basically, any of these might be at play for clinical trials, depending on the nature and size of the trial. Um, now, just another comment on FDA approval, because we do have a couple of drugs that are going through this process. And again, I wanted to explain that there's some time that takes for the FDA to collect the data, make sure that the data is in the right format and is the right quality, and then they need to review it. So telotrostat is under review right now. We're supposed to hear by the end of the month. And as I think you may have heard, the, the Lutathera compound, uh, the review has been delayed, and we're waiting to hear when that's actually going to occur. But this whole process can take, as I said, around eight to nine months. Um, biomarkers can sometimes accelerate this process. We have not had good biomarkers for drugs, for example, like Everolimus and Sunitinib or Captem, where we really treat all patients. We don't really select in any specific way right now. But um, being uh, a triotide avid or having somatostatin receptors being positive on a dotatoc or dotatate scan is a way for enriching for patients who might uh, actually respond to PRT. So that's a type um, of biomarker for enrichment if you have somatostatin receptors. Now, the research protocol, I'm just going to briefly mention this because this is our guide as investigators. It's a very detailed document. It might be anywhere between usually 25 to 100 pages long that outlines who is eligible for the trial, what are the rules, how often do you treat the patient, how do you manage toxicity, how do you um, report um, any adverse events, particularly if you have multiple institutions involved, how do you make sure that you're all on the same page and following the same protocol um, to determine activity and safety of that drug. And these are fairly rigid documents, meaning that we have to follow these to the letter. And so you might find if you're enrolled on a clinical trial, there's only a little wiggle room for when you come in for therapy. And while we want to be flexible, sometimes we can't if the protocol doesn't allow it. Now, things that are important to know for eligibility is that not all neuroendocrine tumors are the same. It depends, of course, whether it's high grade or low grade, whether it started in the pancreas or other organ sites. If, is some of the trials are specifically for disease that might be stable. Others are specifically for disease that's progressing. 
Some may or may not, some may allow somatostatin analogs like lanreotide or octreotide, other protocols may not. So these are things that are listed in the eligibility and will help us determine whether it's a good fit for a patient. Another the question that comes up is often why isn't the trial open or when is the trial open? And I just want to explain that even if we have a good idea, if we have funding, if the protocol is ready, it has to be approved by a variety of different committees at each institution. And this is really put in place for patient safety to make sure that everything is clear and spelled out and is done in a proper fashion. And then throughout the protocol, throughout the time that patients are being treated, the study is also being monitored on a regular basis. And often this is internally within the institution, but also externally. So if it's a trial that's sponsored by a pharmaceutical company, they may also be checking in periodically to make, to make sure that everything is being according, done according to the protocol and according to the regulatory rules. So you can find out about trials in a number of ways. For, for, I would say most commonly it's talking to your doctor. Um, there are other ways to do it. I think certainly support groups often have access and information about current trials. The NCI has a website. Uh, many of the foundations have websites. You can even call the NCI and they can help match you to trials. But it's important for you to think about as a patient whether that's the right fit for you. And there are lots of different factors that go into whether the right, it's the right fit, um, including how onerous is it for you as a patient. If you live in Palo Alto or San Francisco, it might be easy for you to come frequently. Let's say it's weekly. But if you live in Reno, that might be much harder for you. And so you have to find what's the correct fit. If it's a randomized study, are you comfortable with what the two different arms are of the study? And, um, you know, again, it's, um, we want to make these available for you, but I think everybody understands that there are, these are the, the barriers to which I'm referring. It's not always a right fit, and that's something hopefully you and your doctor can sort out together. One comment I wanted to add, Josh had asked me to speak about this in another forum, but so, just a comment on interpreting clinical trials data is just really pay attention when you get something comes across your Facebook news or, you know, the support group news, um, there's a press release or an abstract or something that came out of a meeting. Make sure you're really paying attention to what patient population was this. Is a patient population that's never had therapy before? Are there patients who have had prior treatment? Were these stable patients? Were they progressing? Was it even your disease type? Because again, more and more we're really putting patients in bins depending on whether it arose in the pancreas or the lungs or the, the colon or the small bowel. Um, other things to think about is some, many of our studies have not been able to show a survival benefit, and there are a variety of reasons for that, but most of our studies have shown um, that the drug stabilizes the tumor or delays progression, and that's something to, be, to think about. I personally think that's very valuable. But because this is a challenging disease to study, um, for a variety of reasons, it's been very hard to show major impacts on overall survival in terms of our studies. Um, but luckily, the FDA has used that delay in progression as an, as an indication for approving drugs. And then be careful about comparing drugs from one study to a next, because remember, they could have been done with different criteria, different eligibility rules. So while we, we sometimes will, will do that, we have to be very careful, because they might not have been designed in the exact same fashion. OK, so um, moving on to some trials that are out there, I'm going to show you a couple slides on randomized studies. So these are larger studies that are a bit farther along. All the pilot data has been required, and now they're being um, a new agent is being compared to, to something relatively standard. So one example is ECOG 2211. This is a study that Dr. Coons led. It's now close to enrollment. And all the patients have been enrolled and we're waiting for the data. But that was temozolomide versus CAPTEM for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So a very important study and, and hopefully the data will be available soon. Reminet is a study that actually looks at patients who have already had some sort of therapy, and this is looking at whether there's value to maintenance therapy. So maybe they had chemotherapy for a certain period of time, and then the question is nothing or placebo versus actually going on a somatostatin analog for maintenance. And then the Sector trial is actually looking at sequence. It's looking at everolimus versus a chemotherapy combination, streptozos and 5-FU up front, or the reverse um, uh, and then the reverse at the time of progression. 
In uh, other well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors that are not pancreatic uh, uh, in origin, um, the Alliance 021202 study um, was a study looking at pazopinib, pazopinib versus placebo. This is an agent that inhibits blood vessel growth. And uh, like Dr. Takunza's study, this is completely enrolled and we're waiting for the data. I, I don't have any to share with you yet, but we're hoping we'll have the data soon. And then the SPINET study is a study that's enrolling now, and actually I believe it's open at Stanford, uh, for patients specifically with lung neuroendocrine tumors, and it's looking at the value of lanreotide uh, because these patients were actually not included in the clarinet study, which showed the benefit of lanreotide in the GI and pancreas nets. And then finally, for high-grade neuroendocrine um, carcinomas, there is one study that's out there and open. Um, this is looking at standard chemotherapy versus the CAPTEM combination. And again, this study is open. We do not have it open at our institution, but it's open here, I believe. Um, a few more trials, because I wanted to just, I'm just picking a couple here just to give you the big picture about where the field's going and what the questions are. For somatostatin analogs, I already mentioned the, the Reminet study looking at, at maintenance therapy. We talked about the Spinet study looking at the value of lanreotide in lung neuroendocrines, but people are also looking at dose and they're looking at combinations like lanreotide plus temozolomide. For PRT, I think as Dr. Hope said, we're gonna see a lot more movement in this area, a lot more trials, I think, in the coming years. Um, but here are a couple that are out there. Um, the bottom one is this expanded access study, which is open at selected sites. We have it open, um, and I, it's open here. Pam, do you, do you guys have spots here? For the expanded access PRT, okay. So, um, but again, it's just for mid-gut. Um, but there are other things that are out there. There are other drug conjugates that are, or, or uh, peptide conjugates under study, like JR11. Um, some people are looking at dose, whether you need to have, you know, whether lower dose radiation will work. We heard about people looking at other conjugates. Um, and then there are even studies, there's one out of the Australian group looking at combinations with chemotherapy. Um, then turning now to what we call targeted agents, these are actually looking at um, signaling components in the cells that might actually, if you inhibit them, perhaps you would get an anti-tumor effect. Many of these have focused on blood vessel growth, um, as the posopinib study to which I referred a second ago. Um, Pam's group had a CAPTEM with bevacizumab, which is a blood vessel inhibitor study. That actually is closed now, but the results are pending. Um, there was an interesting study out of the Dana-Farber and Mass General looking at a new drug or drug that hasn't been well studied in this disease called cabozantinib, um, which inhibits uh, blood vessel growth but also some other targets, including MET. And that's the data there are, uh, we're, we're promising and there's hope that we can actually expand that now and, and look at it in a larger population across the country. But I also wanted to point out the NIH has a study where they're looking at um, mutations in the tumors and selecting therapy in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors based on mutation, getting towards potentially individualizing therapy down the road. And then there's another interesting study, a couple others. One is looking at Li001, which inhibits a new target. These are, check, these are um, cyclin-dependent kinases, which may be particularly important in tumors of the foregut, so like in the lung or the stomach. And those trials are now beginning to emerge. And then finally, this PEN221 compound is actually, um, it has a payload attached to a, um, an agent that targets som somatostatin receptors. So it's not carrying radiation, but it's carrying another agent that's toxic to the cells. And we're just starting to see trials now in that, uh, with that in neuroendocrine tumors. And then for um, immunotherapy, this has, of course, been a bit behind some of the other tumor types, but they are out there. And I just wanted to mention there have been a couple trials with checkpoint inhibitors. We've had these open at UCSF. Um, there's also a small molecule that's being studied at Moffitt. And there, I think, we'll be seeing more movement in this area as well. And then finally, in the high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas, I mentioned the, e the EA2142 study with chemotherapy. There are a couple studies looking at everolimus, which traditionally has been used in the lower grade tumors, but a few studies are looking at it in high grade. And then the bottom three studies are studies that we either have open or will be opening at UCSF. Um, the, and actually Stanford and UC Davis have this ATR inhibitor arena TCAN study. That's phase one, so the slots are, 
Um, there aren't as many slots on that, but I would point out my understanding is it's open at UCSF, Stanford, and UC Davis, so there might be ways if you're connected with those three institutions to look for slots. Um, there's an antibody drug, um, antibody drug conjugate, which means there's an antibody to a marker on cells called DLL3, which carries a chemotherapy. So that's only for patients with DLL3 positive um, tumors. Um, and that study is open and accruing right now. And then we will have a checkpoint inhibitor study open um, fairly soon. It's, it's going through the final stages of approval um, for high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas. So finally, I'll end with just saying that our, our, our tools for treating this disease are really expanding. Um, and certainly, this is powered and fueled by clinical trials in this area. But we have to be very vigilant and pay attention that both on an individual basis for your treatment course, your treatment is going to depend on the pace and extent of disease, your other medical problems, et cetera, and your doctor will do his or her best to tailor your therapy. But that's also what goes into clinical trial eligibility. And, and really, you don't know until you actually sign up and get screened whether it's going to be a good fit for you. But very critical questions remain about this, the proper order, the optimal order, how to integrate all of these new agents, and importantly, how to individualize therapy for you as a patient. And I think as we move forward, hopefully, we will be, we will be learning more about the molecular mechanisms underlying tumor progression, how they vary between individual patients, and ultimately sorting out whether there are specific paths and sequences for individual groups of patients within each disease type. So with that, I will end. Thank you very much.